Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is co-hosted by the EBN Tools Network, um, MEME, OpenChannels.org, and MPA News. Um, and I'd introduce my co-host, uh, Nick Weiner with OpenChannels.org. Um, we're very pleased you could be here today. Um, we have on today uh, Rodolphe de Villiers and David Bishop um, from Memorial University of Newfoundland who are going to be talking about crowdsourcing small-scale fisheries data, a global initiative. Uh, we're very pleased they could be with us today. Before we dive into the webinar, I just wanted to let you guys know that um, we're, we'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation with the rest, remaining time for a question and answer. We um, welcome you to send in questions throughout the webinar. If it's a quick clarifying question, I may um, stop Rodolphe and David and ask them the question so they can clarify what they're speaking about. But uh, more substantive questions I'll hold to the end to the question and answer uh, session. But I highly encourage you to send in questions throughout the webinar. Uh, those they, You can send in those questions by typing them into the question panel in the user interface. Um, you should be able to see that in your user interface. So anyway, that's how we'll handle questions. Um, at the end of the webinar, there's also the potential for raising your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon, and then I can unmute you. Um, if you choose this option, please make sure you have a, a microphone that's working. Or if, you, if you're calling into the telephone conference call line, make sure you've entered your PIN, and that, because we'll, those are the only ways we'll actually be able to hear you. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you so much, Rudolf and David, for being here with us. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, and uh, thanks to both of you for organizing this and giving us the opportunity to present our projects. So, welcome everyone. So, I'm Rodolphe. I'm a professor of geography. I'm based at Memorial University, which is on the on the east coast of Canada, in Newfoundland. And David, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. And uh, my name is David Bishop. I'm a research assistant with the Too Big to Ignore project, also here at Memorial University. So I can see from the number on the on the conference call that there is an increasing number of you, and we notice that some of you in the list are also part of our team. So you know you cannot speak, but you you're with us. Um, so the way we're going to do this is to um, I'm going to start giving you some background information on uh, small scale fisheries on the a project called Too Big to Ignore that is uh, led here at Memorial University, but is an international project. And I'm going to give you some information on the uh, system ISSF, which is the main feature we're going to talk today. And most of the presentation will be given by David in, uh, in the middle, which will be the online demonstration. So it's a real live demo, which means everything can go wrong. <laughs> but as you're going to see, it's a very stable system. So everything will go right. And uh, then I will come back to uh, some discussion of you know what we can learn from those systems and talking a bit about perspective with the system and open it for questions. Um, just some uh, background. So my my background, my personal background, is in GIS and geographic information systems. So I was one of the lead on the design and um, uh, the creation of the information system. Uh, so I am. You know, I know about small-scale fisheries, but I'm not a small-scale fisheries scientist. I'm helping those scientists trying to set up a system that is helpful for them. And David was very much involved in the in the operational aspect of uh, ISSF as well. So he has a lot of knowledge about uh, technical aspect about the functionalities and, and uh, how people can use it and contribute data. And that's what the online demonstration will be mostly centered on. So. When we talked about fisheries, you know, there are a lot of different fisheries. So here I just put you two very extreme cases. On the top left, you get one of those super trawlers uh, that, you know, go uh, in the high seas and, and freeze the fish directly on board and bring back to the port massive amount of fish. And on the opposite side, you know, there's just one example, but you get the, the, the fisher, the angler, that is just doing some recreational fishery. So fisheries is a very diverse, um, a very diverse field, if you want. And when we talk about studying fisheries, you can approach it in many different ways. Uh, and what we realize is that very often the statistics we get on fisheries are, are fisheries that mostly come from the larger industrial fishery. 
And why so is because the smaller fishery, which is not necessarily only recreational, it can be subsistence fishery or family fishing just for providing food or generating an income, uh, typically is harder to um, to learn about because they are very variable through space, they are not very well documented, they don't have much reporting mechanism and all that. So in this talk and in this project we focused mostly on small scale fisheries. And even if small scale fisheries is only one type of fisheries, it's, there is a very big diversity of fisheries as well. So here you get a few photos, you know, and the, a small scale fisher where I live in Canada would be very different from a small scale fisher in Africa, for instance. The, the top left uh, photo I think was taken in, uh, don't want to say anything stupid, but I think it's in Senegal, in Africa. Uh, so you get a lot of diversity in fisheries that uh, I'm going to discuss a bit later about. <coughs> So why, why being interested in small-scale fisheries is mostly because we know far less about small-scale fisheries than we know about large-scale fisheries. And however, small-scale fisheries are very important. And why are they important? Well, one of the key elements is that they employ a lot of people. A lot of people are involved in fisheries or in the post-processing of the fish. And estimates say that up to 90% of the world fishers are actually small-scale fishers. So it's a, it's a fisheries that uh, really reaches to people, is important for people, and has ramifications socially uh, that are very large. So uh, you can see also on the, on the bullet points on the left that 95% of the small-scale landings are for local for food consumption. So it plays an important role uh, at, the, at the family level, at the local level, uh, for the people. So here you can see um, an estimate again. Um, on the left is marine fisheries, on the right is inland fisheries, and what's dark green is the small-scale fisheries, and lighter green is the large-scale fisheries. And basically what it tells you is that in the marine side on the left, the catches and the value of the fish are mostly related to the larger scale fisheries, but not that much, you know, maybe 60% for versus 40. But if you look at the other two bars, which are the people, fishers and post harvesters, you know, it's largely dominated. So most people are small scale fishers. On the right uh, diagram, you're going to see that uh, in inland fisheries, everything is la largely dominated by small scale fishers. So because we don't know that much about them, and because they tend to be a bit uh, marginalized uh, in many countries, then uh, some of my colleagues have been uh, created a, re a large research network that has been uh, created in Canada and funded by the Canadian Research Council, but which really um, has extensions and partners all across the globe. So this project is called Too Big to Ignore. Now the Too Big to Ignore project and you get a map, and this map was created at the, at the beginning of the project, so it's, you know, it's not completely up to date, but you can see that you get people like across the world, uh, a lot of different people. There is now more than 300 researchers, more than 20 organizations, and you know, about 45 countries represented. So it's, it's not only Canada, it's, it's the US, but it's like you know, people in Africa, in uh, uh, Asia, South America, and all, all that. <coughs> And the, this network has different goals. And one of these key goals is to try to elevate the profile of small-scale fisheries. And so trying to make sure that small-scale fisheries have their proper place in the policy, are valued properly, and that's when policies are, are made that they consider small-scale fishers. Uh, so second point being, you know, trying to argue against their marginalization, both in national and international policies. And the last point being to try to conduct research, build capacities, and different infrastructure that can help uh, for you know, food security and sustainability of the, the fisheries around the world. The Cubic to Ignore project, you can imagine, huh, there are like 300 people involved and a lot of countries. It's a, it's a big beast, so it's doing a lot of different things. Now, one of the elements it's doing is an information system, and that's the focus of this presentation. It's the information system on small-scale fisheries, which we called ISSF. Um, 
Now the project is also doing different things and on the science side uh, the second point is trying to answer a lot of big questions in, in small scale fisheries. I'm not going to go on detail on this but I encourage you to go on uh, to visit the project website uh, which I'm going to give the link a bit later and you can look at the different questions and different sides of the project, different elements of the project. And then it's building a transdisciplinary framework for teaching and learning and also research on small scale fisheries. Oops. The, the project is organized around research clusters. So you can see the ISSF, the system, information system, is in the central part. It's the global synthesis. So it's both putting an information system and uh, summarizing the information and analyzing it to make sense and provide new, new information about small scale fisheries. But you get a lot of other groups that are looking at different things. And if I only name a few, you get the inland fisheries. Uh, you get people uh, on the you know uh, bottom, for instance, like indigenous marine fisheries. Uh, the small scale fisheries guideline on the bottom left is related to a, a FAO, a food and agriculture organization initiative on um, guidelines for small scale fisheries and so on. So let's focus on ISSF, the system that we're going to present. The, the system was basically trying to be a place where we can collect information about small-scale fisheries and put it in a central place and re-deliver it in some kind of aggregated way. And we wanted to do this at different geographic scales, so being able to describe one community or one region or one country or a group of countries and also look at currently but also being able to go back in the past and we mostly, because those fisheries are very, very diverse, we wanted to go beyond what's the catch of fish to much more attributes describing the fishery about the people and the equipment they're using and what they're using the fish for and where does it go and all that. And not necessarily only text, but also using narrative like photo, videos and different things. So the problem we had is that most information systems that exist in fisheries right now are basically managing information on large-scale fisheries, which is fairly standardized. But we did not have this level of standardization. The way, the way we learn about small-scale fisheries is different, and we could not, if I show you a, an example for a database, we didn't have a database like on the left of this diagram that we could put in an information system and re-deliver to people. What we had were fragments of information from a lot of studies and a lot of people. And for this, we took a very important step in our design. We decided to go with a crowdsourcing platform, you know, something like Wikipedia, where we don't have data that we put in, but we collect those fragments of data by multiple people. We open the database to anyone, and then slowly we build this database on, on small-scale fisheries. So if you look at it generally, it looks like that. You know, from the left, you get the data source. So we're feeding the, the system data. We get the, the database in the center, and then we redistribute it on the right uh, through maps, through tables, through you know, ability to search for different people. And then we have an iteration. We can feed back where people can actually contribute their own data. And I think that's my last slide uh, before David goes, but just to mention that we, we try to have a nice balance in the system between simplicity and richness of information. So we know that small-scale fisheries are, are something that are very rich and diverse, but we don't want to overwhelm people looking at the system. So we have a system where you go a bit like, you know, it's a bit uh, like Google. You, you have a pin on the map. Uh, like what you see on, on the map right now. And then if you click on one, you get a bit more detail. And then at the bottom of the text here, you can go in detail again, and you can go and then you get access. And so you have different levels of detail you can access to unravel a more complex story about the fisheries. Here you go. All right, thank you, Rodolphe, for the introduction to the right. creation of ISSF. So for the next portion of the presentation, I am, let's see, is there a way to make this? That's good. Good like that. OK, uh, yeah, so for the next part of the uh, webinar now, I'm going to be focusing on how to use ISSF, uh, what you'll find uh, within it, and uh, all the different functionalities 
So when you first log on to the website, you will see uh, a map, of course, with a bunch of these orange circles. And uh, what these do, what these are, is they represent clusters of data found within ISSF. So at the moment, uh, we see that there are actually 20, uh, 2,750 records found within the system. And what we can do is break these clusters of data down by selecting on one of these orange circles. So if we went to China, for example, we click here. And then we see a mix of two different symbols. And what these symbols represent are found here along the right-hand side of the map. So we have who's who in small-scale fisheries. That's basically a profile for a researcher or a fisher. State-of-the-art uh, in small-scale fisheries research. This is a collection of publications. We have a small-scale fisheries profile, which shows main characteristics of a small-scale fishery within a given area. We also have small-scale fisheries organizations. We share case studies, capacity developments. Um, people can share their experiences. Uh, this is done through video or through images or text, and as well as another uh, layer which represents the small-scale fisheries guidelines. So as we just showed in the previous uh, slide, by clicking on these icons, we are provided with a little pop-up box which gives you basically just the generic information that's found within. So the authors of this publication, uh, the title, the year, and uh, of that was published. If we wanted to look into that a little bit further, we could click on the details button and we would get, of course, uh, more, as, a, as we said, more complex story. So where it is, what it's about, and then, of course, some characteristics within the, uh, or some issues which it describes. And uh, that's what we find by clicking on uh, these individual icons. So if we go back to the map, once it loads, all right, so we have everything here. So if we wanted to uh, look at this particular map, if you want to um, say another thing we'll look at is small-scale fisheries profiles. Um, there's a lot of information basically that's given here up front, and it can be a little overwhelming. So you may actually want to um, you know, break down what you see or just kind of uh, limit your, uh, your results. So you can do that by searching for, say, something like um, tuna. I got upside down cute, yeah. Say, so let's try tuna. So I put tuna in, we hit search down here, and then all of a sudden we jump from you know, over 2,000 records down to 77. So now all of a sudden we have an idea of uh, any records found within ISSF that actually have something to do with, the, with tuna. Uh, we also have an option to do a more advanced search, of course, which is much more complex, uh, where we can do a st still a basic search or do by country or we can start to include themes and or characteristics that might be found such as uh, ecosystem types or maybe looking at rules and regulations if we were doing by value. So that is how you can do an advanced search within ISSF and that would limit what you find. Um, alternatively, if you're only looking to do a, uh, if you wanted to look at just one um, particular data set or data layer within ISSF, we have the option to interact with these buttons that are found on the right. By clicking on them, you actually turn them on and off. So by clicking on this blue button at the very bottom, we hide all the data. And then if we wanted to look at, say, small-scale fisheries profiles, we can just click on this one button, and then that's all we find. And that makes it much more cleaner if you're looking for particular parts of data. And if we wanted to look a little bit more into what these profiles are, the same as before, we have a little window which shows general information. And then the details page, which in the profile, if we click on that, we get something like this, which gives us a small-scale fisheries definition and then a lot of characteristics about the fishery. So what it's considered, whether it's commercial, indigenous, so on, the places that they fish in, is it freshwater? You know, where to? Is it a river? And then, of course, like we have the gear types used, the vessel types, number of fishers, we also have the governance modes, key rules and regulations, issues, and everything. So by looking at one of these small-scale fisheries profiles, we get a really good idea of what a fishery may look like in a given area. Um, a somewhat new feature we have with small-scale small fisheries profiles is the ability to generate uh, reports. So if a profile has been completed by at least 70%, we see here this one's 78%, we can click the Generate Report button, and what this does is it takes all of that text data and kind of translates it into something a little bit more visual. So we have a table which kind of has, you know, the, uh, a nice snapshot of the things I just mentioned. We also have, um, we have some distribution channels here on how the fish is distributed once it's caught. 
do they keep it for themselves? Are they selling it within the communities, or is it being um, exported out of the country? We also have uh, on this area, we can see the number of uh, fish that they catch and also the tons, the issues, regulations, and of course we have a little picture here um, that you can David, are you able to make that full screen at all? Um, this one. It's not going to be much bigger though. Like this? As big as it gets. Okay, well we'll try, we'll, we'll stay with this. All right, so if we jump back, so that's the small scale fisheries um, profile. Yeah, what we can try to do is, yeah, like this. Yeah, so it's an international project, so everybody doesn't have like a super high resolution screen like we do in North America. So we decided to design the system to be actually visible in most computers in all of the world. So that's why, you know, it appears small sometimes on our screens. Yeah. All right. oh, well, that's good. Yeah, this is good though. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, so if we jump, jump back to the system here, we can uh, go back to the main page. So we have all the data, of course. Um, so after looking at the small-scale fisheries profile and seeing some of the other things that are actually within the database, we might want to look at how to contribute. Uh, if you have small-scale fisheries data that you would like to add to ISSF, how would you go about doing it? So the first step is quite simple. You need uh, just to make an account. And to do that, you click the Login button found at the top right of the screen. Um, you have a uh, sign-up, sorry. Okay, so we just uh, go ahead and we put in your username um, that you make, your email address and password. You'll get a, uh, an email uh, shortly after and you just verify it there. And once you have that done, then you'll have your account. And uh, once you have an account in ISSF, you'll, start, you'll actually be able to start contributing. And you'll also have access to the data within ISSF. So once you have an account, the contribute button is found just on the top of the map here. And by, oh, okay, so I do need to be logged in fully. So log in. Okay, just one moment. We'll go on my accounts. Okay, let's give that a shot. There we go, so this is me. So if we go to um, contribute now, this should work. All right, so we're given a list of the, uh, the data layers which are found within the map. So you just choose the one that you would like to uh, provide data for. So since we just talked about profiles, we'll look at that. So there are um, a couple sections. So basically it's just a fillable form online. You go on and you type in, you answer the questions the best you can. Um, for the small scale fisheries profiles, there are a total of uh, 20 questions and there's a uh, sometimes multiple parts within those questions. Uh, once you fill those out, just hit submit on the bottom of the screen and when you do that, it will generate your profile and that will be put on the map um, wherever it is that you indicated it, it would belong. Um, also, for small scale fisheries profiles, if you, um, if you have information about one but don't want to fill uh, one of these out online, you also have the option to fill out a, a fillable PDF which can be found just underneath the map here. So we have a section there that uh, says contribute. So small scale fisheries profiles. You can download the template for that in English, French, Spanish, or Portuguese. Uh, you can fill it out and then you can uh, you can send it in to us um, by email and then um, somebody within Too Big to Ignore will fill out the profile for you and then uh, transfer the ownership of that profile over to you. And, uh, and that is it for contributing to small scale fisheries through that way. And I may think we just want to touch on the... Maybe I, I can add something on the, on the small scale fisheries profile. David talked about 20 attributes that you have to describe. And just to mention that this has, just selecting those attributes has been a process for over two years, you know, with a lot of international workshops and experts and all that. Because obviously, if you ask scientists what they want, you know, what are the most important attributes documents, you know, like get a list of like 600 attributes. So, so there has been a long, uh, a long iterative process trying to find this, and uh, and the goal of doing that is that then we can compare apples and apples uh, by having similar description of the small-scale fisheries, you know, in Asia and Africa and South America and all that, then we have uh, a basis for comparison which is very powerful and it is actually unprecedented, I think, in this field with this number of records. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you for adding that. Um, so, so now that we've, we've gone through this and I've shown you um, what you see and how things look and how you can access the more details within each record, uh, we've also looked at how you can contribute. So there's uh, two more points that I would like to mention. And one, uh, the first, is that the data that's within ISSF is all available to be exported. Uh, for anyone who has an account, you can click on the export button found at the bottom of the map. And this will take all of the data that's being displayed currently on ISSF and it will, uh, you will download that as a CSV file. Um, if you only wanted particular um, pieces of data, only, only small-scale fisheries profiles, for example, you do as I said before, and you just toggle everything off, turn on the profiles, and then hit export. So like I said, whatever is being displayed in the map, that's what you're going to get. So also, if you did the previous search for tuna, you would export all data on tuna. Um, and lastly, the last thing I would like to show you is that we also do have a help page, which is uh, quite useful. So if there's, uh, if there's anything that's confusing about um, the interface that you're not quite understanding how it works, you can always reference this help page, and it will, uh, it will show you pretty much everything you need to know. So we have a number of tips, so just you know the generic uh, little, uh, little helpful tools within the map, so how to zoom and, and so on. We have frequently asked questions, how to make your accounts, and then there are also a series of tutorial videos. Um, so this basically goes through everything that I showed you today. So what you see, how to make an account, how to contribute, how to look around a bit more, um, the additional features, and then exporting of the data. So if you're ever stuck while using ISSF, just uh, use the help page and you should be able to find all the answers you need there. Um, so I think, I believe that's it for the, um, well, this part of the live demo, so I guess we'll do pro, okay? So I'll get back to the slides. Sure. PowerPoints. Okay. Okay. So, uh, maybe some few things I could mention about ISSF. It's a, so it's a free web portal, uh, anybody can sign up, takes two minutes, you get an account, then you have access, and even without an account, you have access to all the data for free, so we really developed it to sh like open data kind of philosophy, and obviously that raised question, you know, about privacy and things, and our, our policy is like you you make sure, you, you check on your side if the data can be put publicly and whatever can, you know, can end up on the system, and if it can, that's, you don't, just don't put it on the system, but we don't, we do not manage um, you know, access to some record for some people and all that is everything is there. Everything that is there is public and can be used. The the whole system also has been developed only on open source technology, uh, which was which allowed us like a lot of customization about the system. So it's you know the the map seems a bit simple, but you can see the online forms and the number of data sets we have actually makes a, a system that was quite complex to develop. Uh, the whole development took, what, two or three years. Uh, we're nearing the end right now. Uh, and the whole work we've done on ISSF is like four or five years, uh, more or less. So it's, and it involved a lot of people. Um, some of them are online today and are listening to the, are listening to what I'm saying, trying to see if I'm saying the right things. And <laughs> but, um, so, so we have this system. It's a crowdsourcing system. So if, if some of you remember, you know, Wikipedia like years ago, when you were going on some pages and then you were saying, my God, it's rubbish, there is nothing. You know, it, it's a bit like similar to a lot of crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing system. Is it takes some time to build and actually for many things now on ISSF, it's pretty good. Uh, if you look at the publications, for instance, the state of the art, we have, uh, I think it's uh, over a thousand, I have the statistics somewhere, but not here. Anyway, I have, um, it's over 1,500 like different reference and all that uh, that are on it. So it's uh, it's an interesting system uh, which really evolves every day. You go and there are new records and all that. And uh, and one of the idea we had at the beginning was uh, to capture a lot of information about a place. So I, in my mind, I had a, I had an idea that you know if you're a grad student and you go and look at small scale fisheries somewhere in India and you go to a region, then it's going to tell you, you know, who's been there, who's an expert, what papers have been published, what data we know, and all that. So anything that has been entered in the system. So the system that, uh, that has been shown to you is that David showed you is not completely finished in terms of development. We still have a few things we're working on. One of them is trying to develop 
So David didn't show you, he showed you the, the online system. We have another server, which is an internal server we use for development, and we're prototyping right now the, something to do maps like this. So what you see is like a global map of small-scale fisheries catches, and then you can select using the drop-down menu, you could select many other attributes and get some uh, national level statistics or quantities or, or properties related to uh, small-scale fisheries. So that's something coming up and that we are hoping to release in the next few weeks maybe, uh, if not you know, one or two months. Uh, we have other tools, uh, one of them David did not uh, show you, we had a graduate student that uh, in computer science specialized in information visualization that came with a tool, so you have the link from the website, the ISSF website, and it's a, it's a system that allows you to compare places, so those small scale fisheries profiles which are description of a fishery at one place in one village, one community somewhere, of one country, you can you can look at them in the context of many others and trying to see are they similar, are they different, so right now it looks like uh, probably something very confusing at the bottom of your screen here, but it's, uh, it's one uh, common visualization in information visualization that shows you trends, so if, if the lines, you know, one line is one place and every vertical bar is an attribute, so when you follow one line through the attribute you get the values and then you can see you know, things that are common, so sometimes all the lines converge through the same attributes at the same value, which is, and then you, see, you can see outlier data. Um, so anyway, it, it allows you to explore, and you can explore through like histograms and those graphs, and you can explore also through the map, and you can select subset of data and all that. So it's basically, it's an attempt to try to make sense of the data through information visualization. Uh, we have also a postdoctoral fellow, Delphine, which is connected, uh, her name was online uh, earlier, so she's probably listening to us. So Delphine has been working with uh, Ratana Pagdi, which is our project leader, and a and few other people to try to summarize information from the database. So trying to take all of the information we collected on ISSF to date and trying to generate, you know, knowledge and statistics. So for instance, and they published two reports and those reports are available on the TBTI website. So you see the copy of the front page, of the cover page of one of the reports on the top right here, which is basically looking at one data set, who's who, which was the first data layer we had on ISSF. And this data layer tells you, you know, the name of the people and where they are and where they work and uh, which organization they're part of and what kind of field they work in and all that. So if you look at those diagrams, you can see, you know, where the people come from. So, you know, a lot of them in North America, a fair bit in Europe and all that. Um, you can see the, a lot of them are academic in those using the system, the university, uh, but you get you know, NGOs, government and all that. Um, they did a similar report on uh, the state of the art, which are the publications. So publication is not only peer review publications, it's like any kind of publication and report, technical report, presentation, whatever. Um, so di doing different statistics and not only looking at who publish and where the publication, you know, what place they're talking about, but also to looking at like the nature of the topic uh, they are exploring and the species they are looking at and all that. So if you go in, on Google Scholar, for instance, and you look for small-scale fisheries, you'll get information about authors and abstracts and things. But if you go on ISSF, we had research assistant that really, a lot of people that explored the papers, the detail about the paper, and give you much more information about, about those papers. So you can search, you know, sometime by species, by uh, theme, and all that. So, just showing you a few uh, screenshots of summary of information. So, this one shows you a mix of publications. So, each dot on this map is a specific publication about the place. And then the colors on the map are the number of publications per country. So, you can see, you know, there is a bias for Canada because we're in Canada. I know there are a lot of people from the U.S. and you see U.S. is white, so I encourage you to do something about it, even in this Trump era. Uh, and uh, But you see we have like a core of people like in India, you know, get South Africa and all that. And uh, number of researchers is the green triangle, so you see a lot of people like, you know, North America, Latino America, Brazil, Europe, uh, you know, Australia as well. 
So we have, a, you know, like any crowdsourcing system, you have a higher density of people at some places than others. So we have, a, you know, some gaps like China in the system is not very well covered at the moment. And then it encourages us to try to target those countries and contact people and, and then encourage submissions from those people. So a few statistics. We are currently working on a paper uh, that will present ISSF and uh, is submitted to a special issue in Marine uh, Marine Policy, the journal, and those tables were prepared by, uh, among other things, Delphine uh, doing a postdoc on the project uh, for submission for this journal. Um, so you can see here is the contributors, so the people per region and the number of different countries. So you can see that uh, in Africa, for instance, we have 23 people that contributed data in 11 different countries, you know, and then if you look at the numbers, you can see that it's dominated, contribution are dominated by North America and Europe, so those are the people giving data. It doesn't necessarily mean that they describe fisheries in those countries, you know. We have a lot of North American and European scientists that studies, you know, third world countries' fisheries, uh, but it shows you who's contributing. Uh, those are the number of records per data set. That was the number I was looking at earlier, is the 1700 uh, number here on the top right, which is the number of publication we have in the state of the art data set. The, the profile, which are the, the description of the fisheries at the given place, the second line, the profile. This is a more recent data set, so it's still getting populated. And we have 100 and almost 50 profiles at the moment. We have about 450 people, scientists, that are registered and have a profile on ISSF, which is, which is a lot, you know, for a field like this, and more than 250 organizations. So currently we have, you know, about more than 2,600 uh, records in the database. We have um, information on research themes per region, for instance, so when we have, uh, when we have description, we ask, you know, is it, uh, is the research theme for all this, you know, paper, for instance, uh, ecological, economic, social, cultural? So here you can see uh, an analysis per region. So we came with regions of analysis like uh, Asia, Oceania, Europe, Latin America, and all that. And you can start to see patterns. So you see, for instance, here that governance is uh, the lighter gray category is, you know, more often a research theme in Latin America, for instance, than it is in, Af it is in Africa. Uh, however, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, more ecological is about the same, but uh, economic, for instance, is smaller in Latin America, is more in Africa and Asia, Oceania. And then you can start analyzing things regionally, uh, nationally, and all that. We had one layer which was a about uh, small-scale fisheries guidelines, uh, which is this document that was produced by the FAO recently, and we're capturing information about events, so what's going on around the world related to small-scale fisheries guidelines, and here you can see an aggregate, like a summary of things that are going on globally, in uh, well, globally being anywhere, international can be like many countries, national, or regional, and then you can see like workshops or you know programs, conference meetings, and all that. So those are just examples to show you, you know the diversity of things you can get from ISSF. And we we do believe that uh, if you work in small scale fisheries and you want to learn about a country or a set of countries, there is a lot of information you can get, and and this information is accessible. You know it's for free. It's, it's here to be used. The only thing we're asking is like a reference. You know, we got our data from ISSF, uh, and, but even more so, we, we're hoping that you know some of you are going to be encouraged to actually share your data uh, and then contribute the, the assets so other people can access it as well. So, um, the main uh, the main challenge we're we're facing is because it's a crowdsourcing system. You know, crowdsourcing is you know it's nice, it's sexy, it's a, you know it's a new type of technology, and everybody can contribute data. It's good, but it has its drawbacks. Uh, drawbacks is it's, it's as good as the number of people that put data in it. Uh, so we are constantly trying to you know push people and uh, contact scientists and encourage people to enter the data. Uh, we've been going through a lot of different methods trying to encourage people. So we also had like competitions. Uh, so as part of the TBTI project, uh, we had like different competition like for individuals or countries. You know we said 
the countries that provide the most new uh, fisheries profiles, you know, will win whatever. Um, and then they have like a month or two to create their profiles and grab the information they have nationally and frame it in in the profile template and then submit it. Um, we also have a social media presence, so too big to ignore is present on the social media. Um, we have a hashtag for those that are on Twitter, which is TBTISSF, and every time a new record is entered in the database, we actually tweet it automatically uh, to share about the, the new record. Uh, and David showed you the, the whole help section, which you have a screenshot on the right here, uh, which is basically trying to make the system more accessible with introductory videos about you know where to click, how to do, so how do you sign up, and how do you actually enter data, and how do you search for data, and all those things. And that's pretty much uh, what I have for you now. So thanks everyone for listening, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the people that contributed to this, to ISSF, which you know they are like probably 100 uh, that are not David and not myself uh, and some of them are online and other people you know just participated to workshop it's a, it, it has been a, you know it is still like a very big project involving a lot of people and thanking also contributors that put their data in the system and uh, I'll just remind you the the web links for the Tubic to Ignore project and also for ISSF and encourage you to ask questions now or to email us after uh, if you have any question thank you Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, you guys. All right, I just repeat to everyone how to ask questions. You can type them into the question panel of the user interface, and they'll be sent to me. Uh, and I'll relay them to Rodolph and David. Uh, or you can raise your virtual hand and unmute you. But um, again, uh, this only works if you uh, have a working microphone or if you've entered your PIN number if you're using the phone. Okay, so let's see. Um, we have a bunch of great questions. Um, first of all, um, has the uh, website been optimized for mobile devices? No, it hasn't. We thought about it, you know. Uh, oh, actually, has it been? There is a mobile site. Yeah, you see, that's something I don't even know. Because uh, I remember there has been discussion about it. I never use it on the mobile device. But the, the developer, our main developer, Matt, at the moment, I think, was discussing that it was, there was, uh, anybody. Anybody who has a mobile device right now can check. <laughs> but um, anyway, we did not develop a specific app, for instance. We don't have an app for mobile device. But the, the system has been, um, De deployed in a certain way that it's adapting the screen resolution for mobile device. And at the same time, I'm talking to you, David is loading it. You no, know, I'm just feeling the time. Uh, <laughs> but actually, it looks great. So the answer is yes, it is optimized. Okay, great. And also, just um, I, I told everyone they could raise their virtual hands, and then I realized it wasn't enabled, but it's enabled now. So yeah, well, that's good. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, then another question: How are you defining small scale? Oh yeah, I don't want to get there. You know, that's uh, you know, it's like asking a philosopher, "Does God exist?" or something. Uh, it's uh, every time I go to. So I told you, huh, I'm not a. I'm not a real small-scale fishery scientist. I'm a GIS expert developing a, a system for small-scale fishery scientists. But every time I go to a, a meeting on small-scale fisheries, you know, they, they always, there is always a discussion of you know what exactly is small-scale. And then some people say, oh, don't get there, you know. Um, the best, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to put that on record, though. The, the best explanation I got at some point was from a professor from Norway, which is very famous in small-scale fisheries, which says that small-scale fisheries, he says, it's like pornography, you know. He says, you may not know exactly what it is, but when you see it, you know, you know it is. And, and basically, there is not a fine line between small-scale and large-scale fishery, but, you know, there are, you know, when you go in a community and you see that, you know, it's a, it's a man with his son going for fishing and making a a living out of it, you know, you know, it's small scale. So it, it's capturing thing. It can capture things like um, um, like commercial fisheries, but commercial like uh, for a few people, not, not extensive commercial, uh, recreational, Aboriginal fisheries, and things like this. Yeah. And uh, just to add to that as well, um, when you're on ISF, if you're looking at the small scale fisheries profiles, there's a section that's there that. Uh, that is for defining small-scale fisheries for that area. 
just considering the fact that small scale fisheries is different from place to place and how it may be uh, how it may be uh, referred to. So if you look at these small scale fishery profiles, um, everybody who has one uploaded right now is mostly taking the time to define what small scale fisheries are to that given area, whether it's a local place or uh, or something a bit more larger, like a country level. Yeah, because some some countries define small scale, you know, with the the size of the boat or the power of the engine and all that, but it's going to change from country for, to country. So we didn't want to have a standard definition because then it became hard to uh, kind of integrate data from many countries, but constraining them to our definition of small scale fisheries. So we just said, if in your context this is defined as small scale fisheries, then you can enter data. Okay, excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, here's a million dollar question because like we've had at least three people ask about this. Um, how do you vet the data? Uh, how do you assess its quality? Yeah, well, that's that's a very good question because that's the main that's the main concern in terms of crowdsourcing systems. You know, like Wikipedia. You know, if it's crap, and so generally, when you get crowdsourcing system like Wikipedia, uh, one way of vetting the data is just the number of people looking at the records. So, you know, that's another case, but, you know, if you're on Wikipedia and you read something and it's inaccurate, then you're going to correct it. And if you get enough people accessing the database and correcting and they know something about the topic, then they can do it. Now, in our case, it's a bit different because, first, we do not, so anybody can enter data in the system, but, you know, if your colleague enter data, you cannot modify it. And we, we made this, that's, you know, so you can enter data, but you cannot modify data from other people. Only the person that created this record can modify it, and the project staff. And for different reasons, I can talk if there is a question on that. Um, but so what we do is we have uh, we have people, we have staff uh, here in the office that are scanning through and you know correcting obvious mistakes and all that. And we do not obviously have the knowledge. Uh, you know, if somebody creates a, a profile on. Uh, some uh, fisher in Tanzania in a village, you know, I don't have the knowledge if there are actually 15 fishers or 17 or 12. Like, I don't know, and probably nobody else knows than the person that entered this information. So one way we did that, though, is we, um, we added uh, an ability on every profile and every record to leave comments. So if somebody has a concern about the validity of the data, then they can enter comments and say, well, you know, according to this reference, uh, you know, this is not accurate, or I think this number should be different. Another thing we are doing is that anytime somebody enters data about the profiles, they have to actually back it up with some kind of reference. So we have space actually in the profile to provide reference, like uh, journal papers, book, or whatever, to which the, the person looking at the website can actually go back and get the source information. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh... Let's see, and we have a whole bunch of other great questions. Okay, um, what, first there was a question about whether the PowerPoint and uh, would PowerPoints would be available, and I would say yes. We uh, well, I don't know if the PowerPoint will be available, but we will have a recording of this webinar available, and it's going to be posted at openchannels.org. If anyone wants me to send them a link to the recording once it's posted, if you could just shoot me um, ebmtools at natureserve.org. Um, an email and I'll, I'll send you the link to the recording once it's posted. Okay, so back to the questions. Um, do you have plans to interface this with other systems that already store regional level information for some small scale fisheries? That's a good question. Uh, we don't have much plans at the moment because, you know, that was, this project was, a uh, TBTI project was funded for a specific time. Um, so we did we did do effort to actually contact a number of people that had data in different regions and integrate them in our system. Uh, we did not have, we did not design any mechanism to interface directly with those databases because you know it's technically it's a bit more challenging. Like you need to actually feed the data, you know, as they come. I'd say you know it's one of those sweet dreams we'd like to do, but we have not. So no, the only thing we have is we through our network, which is very very extensive. In small-scale fisheries, we actually connected to a lot of data holders and, and made sure that we can get their data. Okay, great. Um, and also a question, what level of coverage do you think you have? Oh, that's a vague question. If I cannot ask for a follow-up. Uh, coverage, <laughs> like, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, how much 
data yeah. do we have compared to how much data we could have? Uh, that's well, that would be yeah, that would be a big question. Uh... Like you know, do we have hundred percent of the data, or fifty percent, or twenty? Mm -hmm. or... Mm -hmm. I'd have to have them uh, specify yeah, that. that's actually what they're asking, but any attempt you could make at answering what you just said would yes. be great. Uh, I'm going to try to, uh, so how much coverage? Uh, geographic coverage, we cover the entire world. Temporal coverage, we then cover the entire time, so that's good coverage. Now, we do not have data, however, for the entire world or the entire time. Uh, most of our data temporally are current, and spatially we have gaps, like I was saying, China, you know, for instance, and some other places. Um, now, how much data? we capture, you know, I could say there is an infinity, there is no limit in the number of data we could have, like, you know, just think of one country like Senegal, uh, you know, you may have hundreds of villages, and then those villages could be described in many different ways at many different times, so it's hard to say, well, I have it all, you know, it's, it's not like a national statistics, like, how much money are we making from this industry, we get one number for one year, like in small-scale fisheries with all these attributes, uh, there is kind of no limit, so I will say the um, generally the we start we start having a good representation for some countries. Uh, it's still work in progress, and it's going to still take a few years before we have a good you know representative things. And one one hope we had is that through those local description of the communities, we could actually regenerate some regional or even national statistics, and for this, we actually need a large number of, of data, so that's something we have, we have in mind, but I don't think we're quite there yet for a lot of countries. Okay, thank you, Rodolphe. Um, a question, can you give us a sense of the resources and timeline needed to create and maintain the web portal and IT infrastructure for this? Uh, time, so timeline, it took us well, it took us four or five years. Now the first few years were mostly like design and meetings and you know the more people involved, the more meetings you need to agree on what to do. Um, the actual development, uh, I guess we, we had on, on a full-time full basis, I will say at least two years of developer, professional developer. Um, the the money well then if you take a professional developer you know which is paid like you know between sixty and eighty thousand dollar at least Canadian you know it's a you you're talking about you know set several hundred of thousand dollar uh, in terms of budget now it does not have to be that complex you know it really depends uh, I mean th those of you that are interested in crowdsourcing generally you could go on um, Esri uh, the company making GIS software they get an app where you can set up in five minutes a platform for collecting data. But it's not, you know, it's not necessarily going to do what you want. Uh, so it's, depending on your project and what you want to do, you know, you can go from something that can implement in a day or two to something that can take years and hundreds of thousand dollars. But the, the system we have, you know, costed several hundred of thousand dollars, at least of development. And it involved we had, uh, you know, one uh, graphic designer for the web. Uh, we had one project, uh, uh, two developers, or even three developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was a lot of staff that was hired for that. Okay, thank you. Um, two questions. Um, I'm using a, this is the, the, the question. I'm using a productivity and susceptibility analysis, PSA, in a small-scale fishery. One of the problems I have found are the local life history characteristics of the species. Is it possible to find this kind of information on ISSF, or is it possible to include it? Uh, well, you can include about anything, so that uh, it's, I don't think it is currently in the system, so one thing is we mostly, ISSF mostly focuses on the socio-economic, cultural aspect of the fishery. We don't have that much information on the ecological aspect. Uh, so, you know, we, we're going to get information on uh, how many fishers are using which boats and which gear to catch which fish, but we don't necessarily know where the fish was caught uh, and, you know, characteristic about this fish and, uh, and all that. So I, I think it's much more of an ecological question that uh, the person has, and I do not think that the system currently can support that. Now, could, could it support it? Um, it could. Uh, we, for every record we have, we allow people to uh, describe other characteristics. You know, we have, like, um, text forms and all that, but it's, it's not really designed for that, I would say, unfortunately. Uh, 
Now, scale is the limit. We could always expand it and add things, but uh, at the moment, uh, the system, I don't think, is the best system for answering these kind of questions. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, is ISF ISSF thinking about adding information on whether a sustainable uh, on a SSF has a <laughs> fisheries improvement plan, an FIP, their MSC, Marine Stewardship Council status, um, and their fair trade status as to whether it's been recertified or not. Well, we're not catching fish. I'm not sure. Can, can we get cer certified? You know, my. Uh, Oh, I'm no. sorry. No, does it include on whether the small-scale fishery oh. um, is it? No. Okay. Yeah. Does no, it no. include these sorts of information about the fisheries, whether it has a fish, fisheries improvement? Uh, yeah. No, it's a, it's a good point. No, we did we did not we did not include that. So that's a fair point. We could have put like information like this. I guess the the problem is the profiles. So the profiles are the description of a fishery at a certain place and. You can describe a fishery like, you know, a group of people fishing for one species, but sometimes you can describe a group of people fishing for multiple species, and sometimes those certifications are really for a specific fishery. So it doesn't, you know, we cannot capture it like this. Uh, so the short answer is no, we don't capture it. Yes, it's relevant. Uh, if we wanted to capture this, it may not apply to every record, though. Um, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay, um, two, well, actually, there's three last questions. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them. Um, somebody asked that, or just stated that they'd like to know more about the web mapping, web forms, and database software that you used, and uh, they thought an email reply would be best, so I'll put you in touch with them offline. Um, and then there was a question, uh, what have been some of the, the biggest tech, technical and logistical challenges in administering the database? In administering, there is not that many challenge. I guess the, I know that some of my colleagues are online, so I don't want to screw it up too much. But the, the from a, from the development perspective, I guess the the biggest challenge, and it's like any similar project, is that the the client, which are the experts in small scale fisheries, don't necessarily know from the start what they want. So you know expectations and you know all these come come along and then it's like trying to respond to those needs, you know, and saying, oh, I like finally I don't want it blue, I want it red, and finally I don't want it here on the right, I want it on the right, on the left. But then it becomes more complex. So some, it's it's mostly has been the challenge, I guess. It's mostly trying. It's not technical challenge. It's trying to communicate it and get the people together and trying to capture properly what they wanted. And trying to have a mechanism where we could prototype, we could get like samples of what they want, and trying to iterate that and, and get it. From the technical side of things, nothing has been hugely challenging. Um, you know, obviously we deal with different technologies. And just a quick answer to your previous questions is we use a leaflet for the um, leaflet for the web mapping. We use PostgreSQL for the database. Uh, Django as a framework and all that. So anyway, we dealt with a lot of different technologies. So putting them together is always complex. But it's uh, I will say like most problems in life, you know, they are not technical problems. Like they, they can be human problems. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. All right. And there was one question. I don't. If the question I had asked you uh, before, that had come in before the webinar, uh, I'll go ahead and ask it. If if you have any insights into this, although I realize this isn't your specialty, um, are there any novel methods for collecting, exchanging, or providing fisheries monitoring data that are not currently being used on a large scale? So, are there any method, but that are not used on a large scale at the moment? Yeah. I guess there is an infinity of methods. Uh, I mean, research has been uh, so, you know, from electronic logbook and things that are used for small scale fisheries, and uh, you know, as like larger scale fisheries are using like just one of them, positioning, for instance. If you want to know where the fishery is going, you know, um, large scale vessel are using system like VMS or, or AIS or whatever they use. You know, which can be expensive, and the small-scale fisher in his canoe is not going to buy a VMS system. It doesn't have an antenna. It doesn't communicate to satellites and all that. But there, there has been experiment. I read a few papers about cheaper way of trying to locate, you know, and position fishers, small-scale fishers. So, 
So there are a number of technologies, you know, and that can be just fishers using their cell phone and an app to record what they've been catching somewhere. And none of those are used globally. Uh, so there is certainly a lot of opportunities for, for developing methods to collect. And we actually, going back to the app uh, thing, we, we thought of developing an app trying to, that we could give to people on site, you know, in those communities to collect data. That's something we, we never got to, but that could be interesting as well to do, is those people could actually walk and collect information like this, and we could give it to scientists to go and collect the information and could feel, feed directly in ISSF. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, this was great question and answer session, Rodolphe and David, and, and great presentation. We really appreciate you guys coming on to do this, um, and we really appreciate everyone who was able to turn out for it. I also got uh, several requests from people who uh, wanted to be here but weren't able to, and so we do provide a recording to it. So if anybody wants to re the recording to send to others, uh, just let me know. It's ebmtools at natureserve.org. But again, thank you everyone. Uh, we're, we're so glad to provide this opportunity for knowledge sharing, and uh, uh, we hope all of you can join us on future webinars. And Rodolphe and David, thank you so much. Thanks to you. And if anybody wants to contact us by email, don't hesitate. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, everybody. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. See you.